Last time on The Honest Channel, leading New York plastic surgeon Dr. Richard Westrick talked us through the various non-surgical skin tightening and facelifting solutions. And he also shared when surgery might be the most appropriate option. Now, for those who missed that hugely enlightening interview, I'm going to link to it here so you can watch it later. But when it comes to some of the most popular and effective non-surgical treatments on the market today, radio frequency, thermal ablation and laser, for instance, I get asked a lot about the risk of fat loss when you're heating the deeper layers of the skin. And it does seem to be a risk. So in this part two of my interview with Dr. Westrick, he talks us through the risk and cause of fat loss and what to watch out for. And he also reveals why plastic surgeons aren't always thrilled by the prospect of treating celebrities. When you do RF heating, especially yeah. if you do much RF heating, it's known that you're going to get some subcutaneous fat loss. And like all therapy is actually notorious for that. Mm. Um, because when you heat fat, it melts, right? Like when you fry yeah. the bacon in the pan, it melts. Oh, God. <laughs> what a thought. If you're, if you're doing low-level heat, you'll probably fine you're going to be low under the fat melting point, right? If you're at 40, 42, 43 degrees, but if you're pushing the envelope with the device to 45, 46, 47, trying to get more out of the heating, then you're going to get some fat loss. Uh, that's, well, well, I mean, that brings us neatly into it because um, I do get asked about that a lot. Um, for instance, I was trying recently an at-home device, radio frequency device, that is made by um, a, a, the company that uh, provides components for the thermage um, treatment. So a few people came on afterwards and said, what about fat loss? I've heard that radio frequency is bad for fat loss. Um, I was asked the same thing with all therapy. The doctor who did the all therapy on me, uh, on me at the time said it was just really important that the pr practitioner knew what they were doing, knew the levels they were aiming for. If it was within those boundaries, you would be fine. Um, I mean, what's, what's your experience? Because there's not a lot of research on the level of fat loss. It seems to be anecdotal, but it's something that keeps coming up again and again and again. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Mm. I think that, um, you know, all therapy is supposed to give targeted ultrasound to a muscular collagen layer. And it's supposed yeah. to not heat up the fat. But it's impossible to be 100% targeted. Um, but if the practitioner is not targeting you appropriately, then you have more spread. It's kind of like radiation, right? You get radiation the primary area, but then there's a radiation field that spreads out from there. So there's a zone of thermal injury anytime you heat anything up. It's not going to be just in that one spot. So you can't reliably prevent fat loss if you're going very hot, targeting a certain area. So, like, I do a lot of face type. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that treatment, but it's a subthermal, you know, heating. I've been doing that for about seven years. I do, I do a good amount of that. I think it's a great treatment as long as you pick the patients appropriately. But I will never place that probe above this area of the cheek or higher. Okay. I never want to lose malar fat. Right? So down here, you know, if you're going to lose a little bit of, of uh, jowl fat, that's fine. Mm -hmm. if you're going to lose a little bit of submental fat, that's fine. Though I use it for tightening in places where if I do get a little bit more fat loss than anticipated, it's fine. I'm, I'm often doing liposuction in those areas anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but I I will completely avoid it. I know some practitioners go very high up in the face. I can't imagine you're not getting substantial fat loss. Something like Morpheus, for example, is not subdermal. It's percutaneous with needles. There's a lot of these microneedling RF type treatments. But what you have to do is go go a, a lesser depth as you go higher up and also lesser energy. Yeah. The skin also gets thinner, so you don't need you don't need as much energy. Um, but if a practitioner doesn't follow those guidelines and isn't respectful, it's absolutely certain that you're gonna have fat loss. Every treatment that you get, 
like everything else in life has a bell curve. Yeah. Surgery, because of the nature of what it is, has a very narrow bell curve. The mm-hmm. difference between the average, the best, and the worst results are not that big of a difference. When you get into non-surgical, the less invasive you get, the more the bell curve winds and winds and winds. When you're purely non-invasive, there's a hugely wide bell curve. And you're going to obviously tell patients the average. You're going to probably show on your website the average to above average results that you get with the machine. Um, but there are other people that make up the other half of that bell curve. And you can't reliably predict who's going to be where. Yeah. And so, you know, some people try and overcompensate by doing higher energies, but then you wind up not necessarily getting better results. You wind up getting more complications. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, it is, it is, um, it's a lot for uh, the person at home like me to try and process and it, and it feels like a risk and it feels like you're taking a chance and I suppose that the one thing um, is that you you just always need to make sure you are with that professional who knows what they're doing. I mean for these treatments okay it's not surgery but probably still requires a medical professional. Yeah it, it's very dependent on where you are you know in the United States Every state has different parameters for who's allowed to use these machines. And some machines, like FaceType, for example, they require you to be a certain type of doctor and take a formal course. That's part of their FDA clearance. But that's not the case for a great many other machines. Yeah. You might do a training in your office, but you don't even have to be an MD. In New York, you know, estheticians, nurses, PAs, MDs, can all do these treatments. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and and obviously the regulation is different from one type of a, a book provider to the other. So that's really important. Again, in other countries, they may have different protocols, uh, which make it a little bit of a narrower band of people that are doing it. But you know, when you go to the med spa for one of these treatments, I, I don't know who's doing the treatment. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. probably a little less expensive, but you know, what cost potentially. So you'd want to check out the independent reviews, look for somebody with a medical background um, and probably somebody with that range of treatments like you talked about, that they're not just pushing you that one thing that they happen to have in their surgery. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, there can be wonderful providers at all ends of the spectrum and terrible providers at all ends of the spectrum. But as a consumer, I think it is relevant for you to at least be aware of, of the training and background of the particular person who's doing your treatment. One thing I, I, I am always interested in is, um, you know, celebrities, I've noticed like Madonna and um, uh, Paris Hilton's mum. She looks fabulous for her age. She just has, like I see on so many women now, a very natural look. Uh, do you think that that is because celebrities are moving away from, um, you know, the overuse of fillers and so on and are now using that mix of treatments, just maintenance treatments once they get to that achieved result? Yeah, we definitely overswung with the filling pendulum. There yeah. for a while, it wasn't just celebrities. It was everybody. Yes. Uh, they're obviously front and center. But I think celebrities, paradoxically, in many cases, get worse treatment than regular folks mm-hmm. because as a provider, and I've been in a situation, you almost feel pressure to treat them because they want something and they're a celebrity. Yeah. And so your mindset is sometimes different with those type of patients than it is from somebody that's walked in and off the street that you've never met. There's less pressure to, to perform, to do things. So I think a lot of them, not only the pendulum overswing, they got overswung even beyond what most normal people experience. Possibly because I could imagine some might be uh, quite demanding and might have something very specific in mind and you might say, oh, I really wouldn't recommend that for you right now and no, this is what I want done. And you think, well, it's such and such, I better do it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pressure in that regard. But I do think that they finally were able to realize, as many other people were, that, that what they were creating was just a facsimile of their normal self 
And even yeah. though it felt normal because they were used to it, it wasn't normal. And yeah. everyone else could see that it wasn't normal. So it's good. I think also industry-wise, we've kind of swung back. And maybe a lot of it is as a result of having better machines. Well, Ten years ago, all we had was fillers. Yeah. Was fillers and surgery. That was it. Yeah. yeah. So if you wanted to avoid the knife, it was, okay, more filler. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happy days. And you think radio frequency might uh, stand the test of time? Or do you expect that in five years' time, we're going to have a whole new toolkit to, to play with? <laughs> I think rate, radio frequency has definitely proven that it works. Yeah. Uh, that's not to say that they're not going to improve on the technology. Yeah. Maybe find something else in a similar vein. But um, as I said, I've had this machine of mine for seven years. That's like in dog years, you know, for for a medical <laughs> that's of equipment, that's like 50 years in dog years. Um, usually every two to three years. And maybe because of COVID, the pace of new technology has slowed down a little bit. Uh, but there have been other machines that came out during that time, but they're all doing the same thing. Yeah. So that's the other thing I think um, I was going to mention at one point when we were talking. You know, I have a face tech, right? Somebody else might have a profound, mm -hmm. another RF heating device, and it delivers the energy a little bit differently, but if the end result is the same heat at the same level, they're both fine. There's no difference, right? Yeah. And okay. there may be subtle differences, but, and most people are not going to have both. So nobody knows the subtle differences between the yeah. two. Um, but they're both going to give you the same result if what they're, the effect is similar. And that's, yeah. again, for, for your consumers, um, what's the effect? How are they getting it? And if that's the case, then this laser versus that laser, or Morpheus versus Profound, or, you know, like if it's similar technology, then they're going to be very much the same. So yeah. you can feel safe saying, you know, this one or that one is probably tossing. Okay, that's good to know. Well, I'm going to let you get back to work now, uh, but hugely appreciate that. Thank you very much for your time, and um, I hope we, we talk again. Me too. It was a pleasure. So what I've taken from my conversation with Dr. Westrick is that I'd now always want to know what other options a clinic or practitioner has available and why are they recommending one particular treatment over another. And that's to make sure that they're not just trying to push that one and only major piece of equipment that they've just invested in and are trying to kind of claw back some of the cost. I'd also want them to be clear and upfront about the risks involved and to give assurances around how they can avoid fat loss. I'd also want to know what would happen and what they do about it if I did lose fat as a result of a treatment before making any decisions around whether to go ahead or not. And finally, I'd only want those treatments to be carried out by a doctor or a registered nurse, someone who has medical training and a clear grasp of human biology and the structure and composition of our skin and the surrounding fat, muscle, tissue, blood vessels, and so on. I think that's really important. And I'd also want to check that they've got good feedback from independent customer reviews, not just the ones on their website. So I hope the interview with Dr. Westrick gave you some helpful insight when it comes to the risks associated with non-surgical skin tightening treatments. I'm also going to dig into the safety of at-home devices, um, including the radio frequency device, which I recently reviewed and I'm continuing to use. So I'll be looking to bring you more expert advice on uh, devices like those, as well as nutrition, skincare, and more. So don't forget to subscribe if you want to watch my upcoming videos and hit the notification bell to be alerted when they're published. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.